dear friends, colleagues, members of the Gynecological Endocrinology Society. Uh, thank you for coming with us uh, at that Meet the Expert on Embryonic Biology with Importance to Human Development and Postnatal Life. This is a fantastic event. We have two fantastic speakers, Professor Fred Naftolin and Professor Eitan Barnea. We will start uh, and then one lecture will follow the other and then we have, will have the question and answer session. Please uh, write your question on question and answer and I will make the question at the end of the moment of the discussion to one author and to one present speaker and then after to the other speaker and we will go on. And uh, now we will have uh, the, our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Frederick Naftolin that everybody knows. He was uh, a Guggenheim Fellow and NIH Nogarty Fellow and a Perle Scholar. He was president of the Society of Reproductive Investigation and of the North American Menopause Society. He's fellow of the International Academy of Human Reproduction and is member of the board of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology, which is the organizer of that fantastic session. Uh, Fred Naftolin, he, he was the chief uh, and chair of obstetrics and gynecology at McGill uh, from some years ago and at Yale University later on and after that research professor of obstetrics and gynecology at New York University until, uh, uh, until now and he is, is presently head of the scientific advisory board of ABO Corporation concentrating on eradication of preterm labor and delivery. Then Fred you have a fantastic talk on something that nobody knows about, which is the yolk sac. Please go on. Good morning. Okay. Uh, this morning I'm going to chat with you about uh, a relatively unappreciated uh, transitional embryonic organ, uh, the human yolk sac. Uh, this uh, yolk sac. <laughs> has been around, uh, sorry, uh, here's my uh, con no conflict uh, slide. Uh, the yolk sac has been around ever since we were around. All embryos, including uh, humans, have a yolk sac and cannot have normal development without it. In fact, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Barnea has, has said it, the yolk sac is a sine qua non, a normal pregnancy. It is the chief source of essentially all of the vital uh, uh, organs and systems uh, in the um, in an individual like you and me. They all came from our yolk sac, and the yolk sac also has given us nutrition while we were we were embryos. Yolk sac failure uh, is a catastrophe. If it happens early, you have fetal wastage. If it happens during the developmental program, you get congenital abnormalities, uh, anomalies that can last into postnatal life. Because of its relationship with the rest of the membranes of the embryo, uh, there may in fact be a relationship between the life of the yolk sac and the placenta. Uh, why have we been so ignorant of the yolk sac if it's so important? Partly, it's a, a matter of psychology. People look at birds who have yolk and have no placenta or uterus and say, we can't be like that, but that's not true. We have yolk. Its formation is during the first few weeks of pregnancy. And uh, so it's been really difficult to study ethically. And uh, the only uh, the evidence that we've had about its development has been the study materials from postmortem specimens. Uh, other mammals have yolk sac, of course, because all mammals have a yolk sac, but there's a slight difference in their configuration, so people have been reluctant to accept data based on them. So all in all, we are quite ignorant of what is, in fact, a, a um, um, uh, an establishment organ for us and we have to overcome this if we are going to make any progress. So what is the yolk sac and how does it affect the outcomes of human pregnancy? 
in order to understand this, we really need to understand the embryology of the yolk sac and, of course, its predecessors. If we think back to the time when uh, there were metazoans, the multi-layered aquatic species, uh, they used to be in the ocean, uh, getting uh, the environmental nutrition and shedding waste into the environment. Uh, and then in order to uh, make progress, uh, evolution is a random process, but in order to make progress, they had to somehow in, invaginate and put the, uh, the, ex, the area that was exposed, getting nutrition and so forth uh, into a protected area. This happened by folding of the of these uh, uh, embryo of these uh, creatures, metazoans, uh, and you ended up with a folded, internalized, external environment, so to speak. But now, not having access to the environment per se, that became necessary to develop an, uh, a system of bringing nutrients from the external environment into the individual. And this, uh, this uh, gadget or invention of evolution is in fact the yolk sac, which takes nutrients from the environment and uh, by histiotrophic nutrition brings them in to the individual. Uh, just to uh, make the point that this has, has um, left uh, stayed until the time, the present time, here is a zebrafish that people are studying for many things in, in science these days. And you can see the zebrafish embryo with its yolk sac. And in the yolk sac is, uh, is a wall of the outer yolk sac, which is having uh, histiotrophic nutrition, bringing it in to the cavity of the yolk sac, which then passes the nutrition to the embryo via the fiddling uh, circulation. You can also see blood cells and the, and the beginning of the vascular system of the embryo, which also pass inside. It, what we can't see is that this is stuffed not only with nutrition, but with signals that, that uh, regulate the differentiation of the embryo. So this is a key organ furnishing nutrition and signals that will bring us to where we are. Um, as animals became a transition to terrestrial came onto the land, it became necessary to protect the embryo from the environment. So there was development of a hard shell like the egg and, uh, and that allowed the uh, embryo to be uh, protected from the environment. However, uh, you had to have two things, nutrition and uh, some place to put the excretion. So uh, during this time, the Atlantois was developed as a separate little garbage bag that sat with the embryo inside the egg. And of course, the yolk sac was the form for the form of the nutrition. In, in the case of birds, they are uh, hatched with yolk inside of the yolk sac, which then feeds nutrition to the embryo, which is sitting on the outer uh, aspect of the yolk sac. Here we can see a kind of a comparative cartoon of fish with their yolk sac. Uh, about 500 million years ago, evolving to uh, terrestrial animals, in this case, reptiles and birds, surrounded by a heavy shell, which necessitated having everything inside. And here's the yolk, the uh, island toys, the garbage bag. And here is the source of nutrition and signals that help to differentiate the embryo. Finally, we have the uh, more recent development of mammals. Mammals have uh, a sort of a uh, form thrust of the allantoids still connected to the embryo, a yolk sac, which we're going to discuss, and ultimately 
with these longer gestational periods and uh, the necessity to get nourishment from the mother, uh, a placenta was developed. Uh, and you can see then the relationship of 30. Here uh, is, uh, some, are some pictures of the three different stages that I have mentioned. Uh, around the time of implant, uh, implantation, we have a yolk sac. Actually, it begins prior to implantation. Uh, it rivals the embryonic disc for being among the earliest organs in the developing embryo. And around implantation, we have a yolk sac and an embryo disc. This is, gives way to organogenesis. The yolk sac is separated and uh, is held on by the vitelline duct. And if we do ultrasound, as we have, uh, we can see that when the yolk sac is still functional, which is up to, say, eight weeks, you can actually watch the fetal heart and the yolk sac expand and contract in beating synchron in synchrony. And then finally, uh, after the yolk sac is no longer necessary for either nutrition or uh, for uh, signaling, the yolk sac is simply pushed down in the below the pregnancy sac, and the embryo now, uh, as it becomes a fetus, is sitting on it in this case. So um, how do we make such a yolk sac? What's its embryonic origin? And here I've expanded that picture that you're now used to, uh, and you can see the embryonic disc, the uh, extra, mes the extra embryonic uh, mesoderm, which is the mesoderm, the cells that are excluded from becoming the embryonic disc, but that doesn't mean that they're not important cells. And uh, one of their important products is in fact the yolk sac. So here we see the yolk sac with the yolk inside of it. So uh, it seems that the embryonic mesoderm uh, is the tissue that will form the yolk sac and will line the inner part of the developing placenta. So you can see now that the extra amniotic uh, mesoderm is absolutely critical to the development of these structures, which are critical to the development of a normal embryo. Uh, this uh, uh, origin and the, piece, the theory that we're talking about of its development uh, come from the work of Borobiak, and I uh, urge you, if you're interested in the subject, to read this important paper in, in Nature Communications this year uh, by uh, Ross and Borobiak. Uh, I believe they are the leaders in the field. So if I can just uh, summarize what happens prior to implantation and during implantation, the extra amniotic uh, the mesoderm begins to form what will be the yolk sac. So the embryo over here has not yet joined the endometrium and already little red dots that represent the uh, yolk sac are present and forming little vesicles that are themselves making histiotropic nutrition that's feeding this embryonic disc. After implantation, there's uh, an organization of these uh, little vesicles into what will be uh, the yolk sac, but it's empty in this case because there's not been time to fill it with material from the extra embryonic telome. Uh, and little by little, by day 11, uh, the, uh, this fused wall of the yolk sac has begun to pump nutrients and signals that will regulate differentiation of all these different systems into the yolk sac from which it go, they go enter the embryo and uh, they play their critical role that we've discussed. Here's a cartoon from Broviac, uh, which uh, shows you not only a late embryo uh, stage of yolk sac life, but you see how 
how closely they are related. And you can see also that this red, which is the embryonic mesoderm, how it's spread throughout all of the fetal of the embryonic membrane, including the yolk sac around the embryo and, and, and lining the inner parts of the placenta. Now, um, I, I mentioned before how difficult it's been to study the yolk sac, and so it's been important to develop ways to study it uh, so that we can become wiser about it. Some of the first efforts have included uh, the use of uh, other animals, uh, in this case rodents, and uh, this is work that we did in the late 1980s, uh, where we showed that in fact, glucose, uh, that in the case of diabetic pregnancies, uh, either induced diabetic pregnancies in rodents or in vitro exposure to excess glucose caused damage to the, the yolk sacs of vitiline vessels. We showed that this was the glucose that did this and the damage uh, caused embryo death and abnormalities of all of these systems, depending on when there was exposure to the uh, elevated glucose. And finally, as a result of these uh, studies, which in, indicated to us that it was glucose and not excess glucose and not diabetes per se, that was the uh, uh, thing that was causing excess fetal wastage and congenital anomalies, we propose that even in ordinary pregnancies, an ill-timed uh, excessive glucose intake could, while the mother still didn't even know she was pregnant, because this is in the first weeks of pregnancy, could actually cause damage in the development of the program. Here's a picture just uh, from that work. Um, showing uh, a normal embryo on the third day after it's been uh, put into a, a tissue culture and uh, left to grow from a neural tube stage to this stage, 50 cell mites, and another uh, embryo that was in the first day of culture exposed to uh, three times normal level of glucose you can see that the vitiline vessels are totally destroyed, are obstructed, and the embryo is hardly recognizable. This is fetal wastage. If we used less, you would have specific, and we did have specific uh, damage to different systems. Coincidentally, there became a series of studies uh, in throughout the United States using what was called tight glucose control. This was Priscilla White's idea from the Jocelyn Clinic on the management of uh, diabetic pregnancies and diabetes in general. And uh, so here you see a study from California where they uh, compared the period before and the period during uh, tight glucose management. And you can see what happened in the two different periods. Here is total deaths. Here are congenital anomalies. Here is stillbirth. I can't see what the last one is, but in fact, uh, you see massive uh, protection against uh, congenital anomalies and fetal wastage. And this really is true. And now we all practice tight uh, glucose management, uh, and we have these better results. In fact, today, a child born of a diabetic pregnancy probably has fewer congenital anomalies than a child born of a normal pregnancy. We've also started to develop ethical techniques to start to study the, uh, this, uh, embry this embryonic organ. And here you see uh, some studies that these are, these are recent. Uh, uh, Al Reese was one of the first people to look at the uh, embryonic yolk sac. But now we know that if there is an increase of yolk sac diameter over a, a 
ardently timed a crown rump length. This is a sign of impending disaster for pregnancy. And uh, there are many publications about this now that uh, this ratio can be used to forecast uh, a failure of pregnancy. Uh, in addition, uh, ultrasound has been used to do the kind of work that I mentioned before. And in the few cases that have been done with a Doppler, one can see the base of the yolk sac at the, here's a, a, this is a picture five weeks. And this is in fact going to be the yolk sac here. Here's the base of the yolk sac where the middling vessels are coming in. Here is a yolk sac at uh, six weeks, uh, very nicely showing that the vitiline vessels are carrying blood flow. And then <clears throat> as the yolk sac is, uh, is starting to die, uh, it's no longer needed because of the pregnant uh, placenta, you can see that the blood flow in the actual yolk sac is actually very small, just at the base where the vitiline vessels are. Finally, uh, there have been there's been the development of techniques that will actually allow us to study the yolk sac in situ. Uh, with with IVF, uh, women are very closely linked with their doctors, and they can be asked to call at the first sign of any problem. If there is a failure, if the fetal heart stops or there's some other evidence that the pregnancy has stopped, uh, one can use a hysteroscope to get into the uterus. And here you can see John, uh, John Paul Rouleau's nice picture of uh, the inside of one of these uh, uh, missed, for the moment we could think of it as a missed abortion. And here we see the placenta, the umbilical cord, the embryo and the yolk sac. So we have hope that we will start to pretty soon be able to report uh, some of the genetics and other things that have to do with the yolk sac. So uh, in summary, what I've told you is that the normal yolk sac is present in all human pregnancies and a normal yolk sac is the sine qua non of normal pregnancy, the yolk sac furnishes nutrition, respiration, organ precursors, and acts as a bridge between the pre-living embryo and the establishment of placenta. The extra embryonic mesoderm of the blastocyst is, appears to be the source of the, of the yolk sac and also contributes to the trophoblast. Yolk sac causes fetal, yolk sac damage causes fetal wastage and congenital anomalies and postpartum disease. This is something that we absolutely need to find ways to study much more seriously. Uh, I could not have given you this uh, overview of uh, the yolk sac without the work of my collaborators who are listed here. And I want to especially thank Professor Daniel who taught it the in vitro methods. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much for this uh, fantastic uh, lecture. And uh, then now it's my pleasure to invite uh, uh, Eitan Barnea. Eitan Barnea, which is the founder of BioInsept and founder and chairman of the Society of the Investigation in Early Pregnancy. But what uh, is important for uh, mainly for of Dr. Barnea that he is a world-recognized leader in translational research and its implication in patient treatment. He, was, uh, he had discovered the plain implantation factor, uh, with a, who is a powerful immune regulator and tolerance inducer that modulates immune response and transplant. Successful first in human fast track awarded uh, orphan drug design at the clinical trial to assess the PIF safety value as monotherapy was completed, uh, completing PIF preparation to upcoming adaptable phase two, three parallel clinical trials. 
And then now, my pleasure is to invite Eitan to give his lecture, and the title is Embryo as a Dominant Role Endometrium as Quality Control Role for Development Biology to Clinical Translation. Please, Eitan, you have the microphone. Thank you. So, uh, my talk is about a biological tango between two parties. I think Fred spoke about the York sac, and I'll be talking to you about the role of the embryo, which has a dominant role in reproduction. However, the endometrium has a very important function. It provides quality control. Since pregnancy, it is really a very intensive interaction where the mammalian system, especially, has to carry the embryo, which could be semi or totally allograft, until destination, which is delivery. So I just want to, as discuss, to share with you my conflict. I founded BioInsect with the permission to open an SPF-based diagnostic and treatment platform. So let's talk about intrabody production, which is obligatory in mammals. If we look at it, that reproduction, it is an active and interactive act. And as Fred mentioned, for moving from fish to bird to marsupial up to mammal, what do we do see? that is a very controlled environment from the fish where the egg and the sperm is released to the mammal where post-conception all pregnancy takes care intra-body. So that it means that there is a decrease in quantity and there is very strong attention to quality. And as we see from unlimited sperm, unlimited eggs, unlimited embryo moving to the limited number of eggs, still sperm remains to be unlimited, but once conception happens in mammals, the number of embryos produced is very limited. And finally, as we move to the primate and human, both the cycle is rather long, and as well, the number of embryos that successfully implant and deliver become very limited, between one and two. So if we ask the question, when does viable life begin? And when we look at it, this is something that I contributed to Discover magazine in 2004. We see an odds, an odyssey to successful human reproduction we see that very early, before birth, the likelihood of success is extremely low. But in the end, once you have good implantation, good fetal development, unless there is maternal disease, the successful delivery of an infant becomes very, very high. So it's an odds game, and therefore two parties has to play, one the embryo, has to be of certain quality. And the second, the endometrium, the maternal environment, has to be very much controlling what is the quality of this product. So when we look at it, it's a very low odds. It starts with fetal ogonia, the fetal eggs, two million. But normally, you'll have in a woman's lifespan only around 200 ovulation. And finally, in a normal couple, the number of children that you have, maybe one, two, or three. So the odds is almost one to one million. So therefore, the selectivity of the egg has to be extremely high. Look at it again. Two million down to two. And then, as you see, percentage-wise, as we move, what happened in post-puberty during fertilization process, the embryo developed. All of them are limiting steps, which are reducing the number of embryos that are abnormal. Finally, as you look further, from fetal period to success, as you see, already after embryogenesis is completed, the failure rate of a pregnancy is very low. So therefore, the first trimester plays a very critical point in moving it from embryogenesis to fetal development, and once, unless maternal disease is there, delivery is very likely. 
And therefore, the quality control plays around between implantation to embryogenesis. And this requires the transition. The embryo needs to move to the fetus, and trophoblast has to become the center. Therefore, as we move to the second trimester, we're speaking about more of viability. Because by that time, all abnormal or practically have been rejected. So it's called the quiet semester. And the third one, until labor, is actually a growth period in preparation for postnatal life. So let's look at it as an embryo driven dominance and PR signaling. First of all, let's look at it, the embryo. It is, has a clear independence and autonomy, while the endometrium has quality control. So if you put it in a dish, and as we see it from I, IVF, embryo can grow two cell, four cell, eight cell, blastocyst, even expanded blastocyst, and even further in certain rats that Fred showed, actually develop almost a heartbeat. That means the embryo is clearly and has high autonomy. Therefore, the amount of action then with your needs in culture is very self-sufficient, provided it's given the right nutrient. You can call it almost like a parasite because it grows until it is unable to grow further when they doesn't have sufficient nutrient. On the other hand, once comes the process of implantation, there is a requirement for the endometrium. However, the endometrium maternal system, as we see more and more in modern medicine, you need rather limited time because prematurity can happen even after 22, 23 weeks of gestation and baby can survive. So there is a limit to how long the maternal system is a sine qua non for continuing the pregnancy, post-implantation until 22, 23 weeks. And that's something that's very important to address. So when we look at post-fertilization, we need to speak about embryo-specific signaling because if there is no signal, the maternal system, there is no need for to adapt, allow implantation, and allow all the effort made that the fetus would be able to develop. So what does it require? The maternal system requires effect must be integrated both local and systemic. We know that as we've seen transplant, if you have local support and, and you have systemic rejection, you have to create tolerance, preserve and pathogen activity and promote maternal endometrial receptivity. The maternal adaptation follows steps, successful implantation, enable embryogenesis, metabolic changes, labor delivery and after birth bonding and nurturing, which is key in mammals. What do we see here? That in IVF, despite all effort, and this is not a presentation but IVF, the take home baby is around 30%. And there are many factors to do. Clearly aging, that means the embryo quality decrease, where the embryo grows in culture, what quality media they have, and whether good fertilization can take place. And that is very important to identify which embryo to transfer because there is a lot of effort made by the maternal system to accommodate the embryo. So how you assess it? You assess embryo quality for morphology. You look at it, you see the stages, and you see here from good quality up to poor quality. But it's a morphological assessment. The second part is that you analyze the embryo itself. You're taking a biopsy. And once you take a biopsy, you can do genetic testing. It's called a PGD, PGM, PGA, to identify aneuploidy and also mosaicism. Then you have the time-lapse photography that you see the embryo, how it develops. But it is interesting that there are no embryos really developing two cell, four cell, eight cell. They have their own individuality, so it has an effect clearly on, on understanding better implantation process. However, it is more individual as an embryo, and some embryos do not develop. So therefore, you have to culture the embryo up to the blastocyst stage. Finally, the embryo has its own milieu environment, 
and it is secreting certain products. And therefore, the embryo media can be tested. And how you do it? You optimize embryo quality from minimal ovarian stimulation to three partite embryo. So the embryo itself has been done a lot, a lot of effort doing ICSI. What means ICSI? Intracytoplasmic injection of the sperm. So the egg is good, but the sperm is not so good. You can do it and still you get pregnancy. Let's move along to see what kind of embryo contribution. And we call it pre-implantation factor. Why it is very important? Because it's a dominant essential function. It's involved in immune regulation, inflammation control, and transplant excesses. It is an embryo-derived peptide, which is started at two-cell stage and conserved in mammals. So there is no change in the sequence of PIA from the rat, mouse, up to human. And what it does is that if you look at the process of prior pregnancy, the embryo denied signaling, which is PIA, which started to cell stage, it starts an evolving effect of conditioning self and conditioning the maternal environment toward implantation. So there is a delay between fertilization and implantation. And then when you look at its biological function, look at the cartoon up here, you can see that it helps the embryo to develop. It promotes endometrial receptivity. It's very importantly also modulate the maternal systemic immunity. So therefore, around the time of implantation, shortly before that, embryo-maternal interaction, that biological tango, initiates. And that is very key because if the embryo is of good quality and the maternal system is a good environment, pregnancy should ensue. So what we see is, and whether our work has shown that only pair positive embryo lead to live births. Single embryo transfer after RDF in human, it showed if you detect detect PIF in the embryo culture media in a non-invasive way, as you see up, pregnancy will come almost 25%. However, if PIF negative embryos, implantation factor one-on-one -on -one will be zero. So therefore, viability of the embryo is key to create the right environment for the mother to accept it and to develop it. And as we see in the lower cartoon, we can see the sickness of the sequence of PIF in the embryo culture preview, which has led to successful pregnancy. So therefore, the view is we can assess transfer of a single embryo instead of having multiple embryo without knowing the really ability to implant. And therefore, we can prevent undesired multifetal pregnancy. So let's Let's look at it at the endometrium as a quality control and embryo role. Well, going back to evolution, we can see, as, as Fred described, the embryo has to be a quality control. It's a guardian of embryo quality. Think about otherwise, if all embryo would implant, it would be an enormous rate of failure. Like this, as in mammals has evolved from fish to mammal, it had showing that the zygote remain inside the body until delivery, and there is a clear involvement of the maternal system. So the embryo is considered to be accept, not accept is critical. If yes, maternal genome is propagated to the next generation, therefore quality control is important. But think about donor and cross-species transfers in the animal. There can be very successful. So the endometrium plays a very key role, making sure that the embryo it is of good quality. Otherwise, there's no reason to put the effort to allow the pregnancy to evolve. So we have to look at it pregnancy as immune tolerance, not immune suppressive state. And it is a successful parasite. No tolerance, no acceptance, unless embryo is viable. So quality control, it's effective embryo selection, assures fetal viability, and newborn survival. These are rigorous embryo selection. 70% loss, fertilization, implantation, and embryogenesis. 50% mm -hmm. neuploid embryo implant, ongoing pregnancy. 
fetal period minimal loss absent major maternal disease. So what does it mean? You decrease clinical pregnancy loss, you successfully propagate on genome and assure for next generation survival, therefore you propagate the species. And here gives you a couple of examples to but quality as a sensor. One, embryo-driven dominance. There are three dominant scenario. One, healthy mother, viable embryo, good outcome. Healthy mother, non-viable embryo, no outcome. Sick mother, viable embryo, potential for life outcome. And if we speak about the failure of pregnancy, is the quality control. One, failure to implant, implant and reject, implant failed development, and implant develops support fetus to delivery unless maternal disease. And there are methods to assess how is the endometrium. You see here ultrasound looking about endometrial thickness. And here you speak about genetic test of the embryo, but not only, but here it is speaking about ejective tests of the endometrial itself and finding the right window for implantation, which is very limited because it's narrow. So therefore you need to have a good embryo and you have a good receptive environment which has to be identified. And you assess it by histology, lining, gene array, or even microbiome as recently shown. However, you have to look at it. Although the endometrium is a preferential site, a pregnancy in, in human, obviously, can happen in tubes, ovary, and abdomen. So it is, although a preferential, it's not an obligatory site for implantation. However, all pregnancies outside the uterus fail. So the endometrium has a quality not only to accept the endometrium of the embryo, but also propagate that pregnancy until end. Other sites, as I mentioned, lead to failure. So let's go back to PIF, pre-implantation factor. It comes from the two cell stage embryo, and it is time secreted by the embryo to help. And what we see based on published data is that it has a promoting effect before to prime, during to help the opposition adhesion, and third, it helps for invasion, which is a trophoblast invasion. So we speak about priming, promoting receptivity, and favorable uterine environment. And when we look in the trophoblast, because it's a very key between interaction of the embryo and the maternal system, PI promote regulate proliferation, apoptosis, tolerance, and immune protection. And as you see the expression of PIA by immunohistochemistry in the first trimester, in the implantation site, very high expression. And as you see, as we go into our end of pregnancy toward delivery to very minimal expression alpha omega system. Now, what is very key? One, important to promote tolerance. One of the prime molecules of tolerance are HLAG. And what we find is that PIF action on the trophoblast cell is to promote HLAG, which is a prime for tolerance production. Second thing is, which was very important, as we look into progesterone versus PIF, as promoting these pro-tolerance molecules. And what you find in side by side, the PF has much higher ability to promote the HLAs compared to progesterone. This would indicate, and if we look into the biology, that when starts pregnancy, progesterone is there and PIF already present in the two cell stage embryo. So it helps the placenta to improve its ability to respond to progesterone. So overall, if we're summarizing, then we can speak about the embryo endometrium synergetic collaboration. And both play an essential role. And as I mentioned before, it is like a biological tango. First you lead, then I lead, but finally, we both have to have critical function because if we stay in step, Tangos is very well done. If we do not 
then either the quality of the embryo is poor or the endometrium is not receptive, pregnancy will fail. Now, let's go for the last point, which is called embryo fetal protection, PIF, and transplant acceptance. What do we learn from the embryo in using PIF as a synthetic peptide to see whether it has a function beyond what we dis discuss? So we speak about translational impact, the paradigm shift by regulating inflammation, immunity, and transplant. And how we look at it? It targets normal and activated immunity, regulate oxidative stress, and locally and systemically action. So very importantly, what you see in this graph is to show that PF target the human maternal immune system. And as we saw below that, we see regulate oxidative stress. It's a prime agent of destruction of the cell, regulates activated immunity, and actually blocks immune function when it's overactive. Therefore, its prime target are macrophages, neutrophils, and activated T cell and B cell and regulating NK cell. So, translational wise, PF reduces fetal loss, spontaneous, and the inflammation that use. That means PF coming from the embryo, able to man maneuver the maternal immune system to reduce, as you see here, control versus PF, threefold decrease, and also inflammatory agent like LPS, which is reflecting a bacteria, decreasing it twofold. But what is more important, if you see on the lower part, that PF promotes fetal weight to optimize it while not changing placental weight. Therefore, the environment that PF creates for the pregnancy in an immune intact model to favor progress of pregnancy to the end. And as we go outside for pregnancy, just to finish, we show that PF promotes allotransplant acceptance. Here we have a case, for example, for semi and allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And therefore, when we look at it, allotransplant or semi-transplant is an example of what happens in pregnancy, semi-donor or allogeneic donor. And then give you one more example. It achieved allotransplant in primate, ovarian return to cyclicity after transplant, and there is no rejection. Finally, I want to show you that they have also can have an effect on bioartificial adrenal transplant. It may be a source that bovine sex can be cultured with PIF and then to transplant them for patients who have Addison system. Let's conclude about that. That FDA in part SPF privilege status provides orphan drug designation, a Fraxas award. And I would like to give you a take home message like this Embryo viability essential for reproduction. Reproduction is active, interactive, acts through the evolution. Mammalian embryos, intra body reproduction, and embryo driven signal PIA drives endometrial receptivity. Second, endometrium is a quality control role in mammals, sensor, and it has a selfish preservation act, and endometrium is preferential but not exclusive. Finally, we speak about the pro-pregnancy property, promoting endometrial receptivity, trophoblast invasion, and immune homeostasis. And finally, I'll give you some information which I'll be sharing with you much more, hopefully during the conference, related to the translational aspect of PIF. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eitan, for that beautiful lecture. And then now we will go to our question and answer. Please, I invite everybody to write their question on question and answer. And we will start with some already arrived uh, question. You can put your name or they can be from anonymous. We have one from anonymous for Professor Naftali. Fred, the question is, what is the relationship of the embryonic germ cells to the yolk sac? So this is a, an extremely important question because, as you know, the embryonic uh, uh, just, uh, uh, germinal cells uh, somehow have to enter uh, uh, development without becoming differentiated. Uh, they have to remain undifferentiated until they are 
called upon uh, later in life to uh, be fertilized. And so it appears that th these uh, cells actually migrate from the genital ridge into the area of the uh, elantois and uh, yolk sac, where they kind of hide out during the differentiation period. They hide out from the signals that are coming from the yolk sac that are uh, developing uh, the gut, the uh, heart, the, the uh, other vessels and so forth. And once that period is over, the cells then re-migrate back to the genital ridge, but still undifferentiated. So the yolk sac uh, appears to furnish a haven for these cells, protecting them from uh, signals that would have prematurely differentiated them. Thank you very much, Fred. And then now on a question for Eitan. Eitan, they ask uh, to have uh, a little bit more details uh, on PIF properties. And then PIF has an innate modulatory uh, re regenerative effect and transplant acceptance properties. Can you go more uh, in details on this point? No, you have the microphone closed. Yeah. Please open your microphone. Yeah. Hey, what I'm okay. saying is the way to look at it is that the embryo from earlier stages has to fight against odds. And therefore, what it does, it had to create an environment, one, for self, what it means, the embryo is inside the zona pellucida, and therefore you needed to create the ability to develop almost independent of the maternal environment, since there is a zona pellucida. And what we have shown that we have promoted embryo development and also protect it from adverse environment. So that is level one. The second one, it helps for the endometrium to accept the endometrium, the embryo. Because if you look at it, there is a distance between fallopian tube and the endometrium. So therefore, also there is a delay between fertilization and implantation. And even you can see it in in vitro fertilization after you do embryo transfer, it takes four to five days to implant. So unless there is a priming process, and what is a priming process that the embryo itself is supposed to be receptive, but it will be receptive conditional. If the embryo gives the right signal, then it will be receptive. So what we have seen from perspective, pregnancy perspective is one, promote and protect the embryo. Specifically receptors involve heat shock protein, oxidative stress element, tubulin, actin. So therefore there is a direct interaction in receptor dependent. The second part, as you look at it outside pregnancy, it becomes translational. You take the synthetic peptide, you make it a GMP quality, and you tested it from different models. You can speak about neural development, neural uh, neuroinflammation, neurotrauma, things, immune regulation without suppression. And the idea is, would be is that the effect is since it's receptor dependent, it's targeted both locally and systemic, creating like an integration. So we have data on juvenile diabetes, neuroinflammation, quite a bit on transplantation that I shared with you. I wanted to reserve some of the slides for our December <laughs> conference. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, we preempt <laughs> what I'm presenting. But overall, you know, the focus in the December meeting will be really to give much more on the translational aspect of PIF, because as we finished already phase one clinical trial, and we are funded by NIH for doing multiple study moving toward phase two clinical trial. There's a lot of application, but the key word, PF is safe. And that we have shown in long-term toxicology study. And when you have safety and you have an immune regulatory function, that's something to us very important that learning from nature, we can apply it in medicine. Thank you. We are full of hopes, full of hopes. And now a question for Fred. Fred, you mentioned diabetes. And then are you proposing that diabetes per se is not harmful to the embryo fetus? 
Uh, yes, uh, there's, there is no evidence that having diabetes per se is harmful yeah. to embryos. It only is uncontrolled diabetes. Now, we can't generalize this to adults uh, because there isn't enough evidence that deals with the other uh, changes in the environment of the diabetic person because even uh, the most well-controlled diabetic will go on to have many other problems. We have to assume that the, that the uh, control mechanisms are having their own effect. But in the case of the embryo, there is no data that shows that having diabetes per se causes embryo damage. Thank you, Fred. And then now we have a, a question from uh, Catania Rosolino. Uh, she asked uh, Eitan, what about the role of PIF and T cell reduction hyperactivity or start for macrophage? Okay, so we speak about homeostasis. And homeostasis is very critical because the pregnancy should not be an immune suppressive environment. If we look in human, the human is protected. But if we look in all mammals, they just walk around in their environment. And even when the baby is born, it is not in a very sterile environment. So therefore, maintaining as much as possible antipathogen activity is very key. And the paper that we published in, in PLOS One that I showed, for example, that if you create a bacterial antigen which is LPS and inject it, it creates fetal death. And what we have shown that we have protects against it. So bottom line is like this, we have target macrophages and neutrophils. And therefore maintaining that first response of the innate system not to be overactive. Now, macrophages also have act like antigen presenting cells. Since we have part target macrophages, therefore is able to regulate as well T cell when it's hyperactive. And why it is happening? Because the receptor for PIF on T cell in maternal system is very low under unstimulated condition, maybe around 4%. But once you have adding a pathogen, LPS, you go up almost to 90%. So therefore is able to control the overactive immune system and bring it back to that homeostasis that we see in pregnancy. Fantastic. Then another question for Fred. There is a dispropionate yolk sac diameter to crown ramp ratio. Is there anything that could be done to avert fetal death? I think it's too early to, to answer that question. Uh, the main uh, issue presently is to follow the yolk sac and see whether either a deformed yolk sac or a, 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 a greatly enlarged yolk sac compared to crown rump length is present. And then consider what is going on in the pregnancy. Uh, but at this, at this point, we don't know anything about trying to use this as a, uh, an indicator of some specific treatment. Thank now, you, most Fred. pregnancies, most yes. uh, pregnancies at that, that time will be a cause, or failures will be caused by uh, genetic problems. And so I, my guess is that uh, it will be difficult to use this as a guide. Thank you very much. And then now another question from an anonymous to Eitan. <clears throat> uh, this is on the, on the role of embryo dominance in mammals. And then embryo control is on its own destiny and the good quality prevails and the embryo can be considered as a parasite? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> if we look at it, the embryo by nature is an entity that can develop in many environments. That means, as I showed you, it can develop in culture. And Fred showed you that it can grow, even develop a heartbeat. 
an embryo. So therefore, it is very independent unless you have the right environment for him. When we speak about mammals, therefore, to create a good outcome, you really must have a quality control. Otherwise, it will go wild. So that's the reason, unless it implants inside the endometrium, it should fail. Because otherwise, if you have a tubal pregnancy, the chance of death is really high. If you have an abdominal pregnancy, we all know about those things can happen. Also, it's a very high risk. So nature has built that if the embryo should be doing well and promote its growth, mostly it will happen in the endometrium. So although it's a parasite, it needs a maternal environment to control it. Otherwise, it could be like an uncontrolled parasite. Okay, then we as we are approaching to the end, we have a, a, another last question to, for Fred, which is a, a wide question. Uh, this uh, would like a discussion on the, on the relationship of the extra embryonic mesoderm to other extra embryonic membranes, such as the placenta, as well as the makeup of the magma reticularity that you mentioned, and how it is regulated. So this is an area that we are particularly interested in studying. That is, does the, meso does the extra embryonic mesoderm in covering the entire inside of the developing uh, blastocyst have effects that are much outside of simple histiotropic nutrition or signals uh, passing. And in fact, we believe that's the case. And uh, we hope that we will be able to define particularly the relationship with the placenta. The, the cells that will become, or that the cousins of the cells that will become the yolk sac are actually interspersed with the cells of the cytotrophoblast. And so uh, we believe that it's possible that they may have some effect on things like implantation success. And implantation success is the key to pregnancy success. So we will, we will pursue this in the coming years. And then also some words about that magma reticularis that you mentioned. Because I so think that very few know what it is, the <laughs> magma reticularis. The, the extra embryonic coelom is, a, is a, a fluid which contains uh, the nutrition and the signals that are going to be pumped into the embryo. And uh, as this becomes concentrated, as the yolk sac pulls the fluid out, uh, it becomes concentrated, and this allows the amniotic sac to expand. So uh, little by little, this concentrated, uh, formerly extraembryonic coelom, it forms a kind of a goo, which is called the magma reticularis. And in fact, the magma reticularis remains between the amnion and chorion, and if you, uh, at the, uh, when the baby is born, you want to separate the amnion from the chorion. It's very simple. You just cut it and then start pull them, pulling them apart. The, the goo between them, which may be very mm -hmm. tiny amounts, is the remainder of the magma reticularis. Thank you. And then and now, to, to conclude, the last question is for Eitan. Uh, it's a question related uh, to the uh, endometrium and the quality control. Uh, endometrium is a quality control for its own semi allograft or much any other allograft. Yes. Um, it's a very fine the question. Yeah, yeah. The, the mammalia reproduction through IVF has shown us that the endometrium is agnostic. It does not care whether the embryo is coming from the same woman who got fertilized in vivo by her, by her partner, but any IVF embryo, whether it is semi, donor, even cross species, we have shown it. So what we can say is that the endometrium looks as is the right signal is there, is the capacity to develop is there, 
Therefore, should I accept it or reject it? Why? Because it takes enormous effort between one maternal recognition of pregnancy, which is signaling, but the second one, which is much higher power, it's called maternal adaptation to pregnancy, which requires metabolic, enormous effort of resources in order to bring to an end product, which is a delivery. So the quality control has to prevail because otherwise would be a lot of wastage without good outcome of pregnancy. Like this, it's limited the loss and maximize the outcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wonder, if, you, I you. Might, I, I wonder if I might ask uh, in follow-up of that response, uh, Eitan, can you discuss what the, the what is making it so that toxemia is caused by the first, it occurs in the first pregnancy, not in the second one or third or fourth, but if there is a new partner, you get uh, toxemia again. Uh, so you have the embryo making theoretically the same amount of PIF, but you have a difference in uh, the generations. Yeah. Uh Two things. So first of all, if it's the same partner, the endometrium has already adapted and was successful because success breeds success, failure breeds failure. So that kind of number one. Now, with respect to pregnancy with a new partner, if you, re you realize the trophoblast is male-dominated genome and the embryo is more maternal-dominated regarding to expression. So if it comes a new genetically product, which make the trophoblast, the recognition process which happened before and was successful, it likely to be reduced. That I think that, that the only thing that I can give you as a information, but it makes sense since the trophoblast is semi-foreign even to the mother. So similarity and differences may play a role in success versus more rejection phenomena. Thank you. Okay, dear friends, we are uh, 10 past four in Italy and then we are uh, uh, over our time. I would like first of all to thank Fred, <laughs> yes, I would like to thank Fred Professor Fred Naftin and Professor Ethan Barnea for that fantastic session of science for the future. We need a better survival of humans in our environment. You have seen now the COVID-19 is a threatening event as it was. And then we have crossed all what was present previously and we will cross over also this one. And for that, we need the Yolksack, we need the, the pre-implantation factor. We need that all those who were protecting us until now will continue. Then, thank you very much, Fred. Thank you, Eitan. Thank you for, thank you then, for having us. Thank you. Pleasure. And then pleasure. I invite you, I invite all uh, our uh, public to participate to the next uh, uh, webinar, which will be devoted to the hormonal contraception in risk groups and perimenopausal patients. It will be September 24 at 15.00 Central European Summer Time, and Martin Birkhauser and Alfred Mück will be the speaker. Thank to all of you. Have a healthy and beautiful time in your cities and all over the world. Many thanks. <laughs>